Welcome to week six, lesson six of our series on Joseph. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. You are King of kings, Lord of lords. You're our master, our savior, our shelter in the time of storm. Oh God, just help us to really receive word today. We're like spiritual sponges, Lord. We just desire to soak up every truth you have for us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we learned how important it is to believe God's eternity and his goodness. We saw how favor spills over to those around us. This week we'll see how Joseph handles prison. Genesis chapter 40, beginning with verse 1. Genesis 40, beginning with verse 1. Sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offered their royal master. Pharaoh became angry. I'm sorry, offended their royal master. Offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with these two officials, and he put them in prison where Joseph was, in the palace of the captain of the guard. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them. Sometimes we're not happy with those around us. Indeed, sometimes we must pray that God remove those who trouble us. The challenge is to discern what God is up to. Does he want to use me to bless a difficult person? Or does he want me to exercise faith and believe for the person to be moved? Just remember to seek what God is doing. Some of you have heard of Dr. Paul Cho or Youngie Cho or David Cho, uh, the pastor of Yoido Full Gospel church, the largest church in the world, and he is sometimes accused, and I would argue falsely accused, of teaching the prosperity gospel. And what he did is, he did say that we should claim what it is we're seeking in the name of Jesus and believe God for it. However, he said before we make our claim we must seek God's holy yes. In other words, we spend time with God and we pray and say, God, is this something you want me to have? God, is this something I can believe you for? And we don't start claiming anything until God says, yes, this is what I have for you. And quite frankly, I think where the prosperity gospel went wrong in the United States, especially as people started claiming stuff that God had never promised them, stuff that God didn't want them to have, quite frankly. And, and, and they would lay claim to things that God had no intention of bringing into their lives. And, and then when it didn't happen, they'd say, well, the Bible's not true or God's not true or uh, you know, they, they became disgruntled. And the reality, it was, it was never faith in God. It was faith in wealth or faith in provision or faith in stuff. But what Dr. Cho had always taught was you pray and you seek God's will, God's direction, God's holy yes before you lay claim to anything. Verse 5. Continuing with verses 5, 6, and 7. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so upset? Sorry, why do you look so worried today? He asked them. Verse 7, let me read it again. Why do you look so worried today? He asked them. In the Department of Corrections, this is called a baseline. Joseph noticed that the cupbearer and baker were off their usual behavior, that something was different, something was bothering them. 
This is a fancy way of saying that Joseph cared about those he worked with and took the time to notice when things were not okay. Not only did he notice, he asked. Most of us have experienced someone asking how we are doing. <laughs> and then before we can even answer, they pass by. Worse yet, we answer, they say, how are you doing? And we say, not so good. They say, oh, glad to hear it, me too. Granted, we have a custom of asking how others are doing, and we expect them to respond, fine, thank you, and you? I used to teach that in English all the time. Nevertheless, as Christians, we should take time for a sincere response. And I've noticed lately this has become a thing to do is, how are you doing? No, no, no. Really, how are you doing? I really want to know. And we should be ready to listen hard. Sometimes the only appropriate response is, that's so hard. You mind if I pray? This phenomenon is so common. A Christian song has been written describing it. Uh, and the name of the song is The Truth Be Told by Matthew West. And, and I think he's hit it so well, I'm just going to read the lyrics to you. Again, this is Truth Be Told by Matthew West. Lie number one, you're supposed to have it all together. And when they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them, never better. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. But the truth be told, the truth is rarely told. No, I say I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. But I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall. There's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. There's a sign on the door says, come as you are. But I doubt it because if we lived like that was true, every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. So didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A safe place for the sick, the sinner, and the scarred, and the prodigals like me. But truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Oh, I'm the only one who says, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. But I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under control. But it's not, and you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall. There's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. Can I really stand here unashamed knowing that your love for me won't change? Oh God, if that's really true, then let the truth be told. I say, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. But I'm not. I'm broken. And when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not, and you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall. There's no sin you don't already know. Yeah, I know. There's no failure, no fall. There's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. And all God's people said, Amen. Verse 8, continuing with verse 8. And they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. Let me take a moment to say, I believe in this. My home denomination is Pentecostal. We believe in tongues, prophecies, and healings. We also believe in dreams and visions. The prophet Joel declares in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, Joel 2, 28 and 29. Then after doing all those things, 
I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Here at Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, we were blessed to have a group of Burundi Christians in our church for several years. African Christians often have dreams or visions. I love the Bible, but sometimes God uses other means to speak directly to his people. Verses 9 through 15. Verses 9 through 15. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. First, in my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom, and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding the Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might help me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland and the land of the Hebrews. And now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. The cupbearer must feel so good. He knew right away that Joseph had correctly interpreted his dream. Even non-believers will often recognize the power of God. Uh, I remember one time at uh, the detention center, our group of volunteers said that they wanted to bring in this special guest. Her name was Katie Souza. And... Um, so they brought her in, and she had been a federal inmate, and by the way, she now has a, an incredible ministry. And the first time she had been in prison, I believe, was our facility. And after she had done her teaching, and it was, you know, it was very good teaching, and they could all relate to her so well, uh, she was calling the ladies up and she was prophesying over them and, and giving them a word from God. And there was one lady in the line and I was behind Katie and I knew that this particular inmate didn't believe in God. She was up there to see if Katie would make something up. And when she got up and Katie, she was before Katie Souza, uh, Katie pulled her down and said, hey, come here, I want to talk to you just one-on-one -on -one privately. And of course, I was right behind so I could hear it. And when she pulled her down, she said, look, if you want to hear from God, he'll speak to you, but you need to stop playing games. And I was like, wow, she has discernment. I mean, this is God. And it was so powerful. And I believe at that moment, I don't know if that lady became a Christian at that moment, but she had to realize there was a God in the universe because God had just told her to quit playing games. And I, I, I was like, wow. Um, I was recently on a Christian forum and a particular minister was being blamed on this forum. And I responded and I said, look, I don't know much about this person's teaching, but I could tell you this, they're very generous to prisons. It's a pretty wealthy ministry, and they give a lot of Bibles to us. You know, every quarter they'll send us a shipment of Bibles. And I thought, you know, it's right to defend this person really by giving a testimony. I, I'm not addressing the criticism. I'm just saying, look, this person didn't have to do this good thing, and they did it anyway. And it's something you better know because you're busy piling on this person and saying that they're teaching wrong or whatever you want to say. Maybe you're right, but you need to know this. This minister is very generous to prisons. And they couldn't argue with me, but you could tell they were irritated that I had mentioned it. Look, Joseph never gave up on his innocence. 
God used his servitude and his imprisonment for his glory. But that didn't mean that what happened to him was just. His defense is true and right. Maybe God has and is using us in places we don't belong. I I, I say this to the individuals in the jail all the time. Maybe you don't belong here according to justice. Maybe you were falsely accused or maybe you confessed to something you didn't do because you thought it was a way to get a shorter sentence. That's between you and God. But I said, while you're in the prison, God is using you. If you're a Christian, you are a prison minister as long as you're inside. And I say this to you, where do you work? You are God's representative in that place. Are you in school today as a student? You are God's representative in that school. Are you a teacher today? Are you a principal? Are you a blue collar worker in a profession? Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God and understand that you represent Jesus 24 7, 365. God wants to direct us towards him and he wants to use us to direct others towards him. Sometimes he brings difficult people our way so we can love them. Sometimes it is healthy and right to pray that God removes such people from us. Sometimes, you know, they, they use this term toxic. There's people that are toxic and we just need to not be near them. And what we do is we say, God, if we don't know, we say, God, show me so that I can pray confidently. But until I know, I pray, help me to be a minister to this person as long as I need to. But Father, this person's hard, and it may be your will to remove them from my life. Please do that in Jesus' name. The key is to discern the direction God wants you to pray. And until you're there, God, give me strength. And in the right time, either use me to break through or remove them. (laughs) Joseph had favor with God, and the favor spilled over to the warden and, frankly, to his fellow prisoners. He had favor with the warden by being truthful and sincere. He had favor with his peers because he had favor with God. Often, the most powerful gift we can give is to listen hard. We may not have an answer, We can always pray. And sometimes that's all that's needed. You know, frankly, sometimes I just pray on my own because the person tells tells what they want to say and then then they're good. They say, oh, I feel a lot better. Thank you. And I I haven't said a thing. But I said, you know what? Even though you feel better, I'm going to pray for you. And often that has as much power as listening and as anything I might have said. Finally, God blessed Joseph with the gift of interpreting dreams. Why not? Our supernatural God empowers us with the supernatural. Amen? Uh, I always remember as a young person, I was in my teenage years, and Richard Roberts, the son of Oral Roberts, was having a crusade in downtown Seattle, and I went to uh, hear him. And he was just very direct and very uh, straightforward about what he did. He said, God, you know, you used my father in healing. I would like that same gift. God, use me to heal people. That was his simple prayer. And, and God gave him that gift. And he said, the way it 
tended to work in his life is when he was preaching at a certain point he'd maybe feel like a warmth in his ear or a twitch or something and he realized God was doing a work with somebody's hearing or somebody's ears and if he felt it in the eyes God was doing something with vision and if he felt it in his thighs maybe God was healing thighs or legs but that's how God worked with him and and, and he wasn't trying to hide state secrets or anything he said this is what God does if you have a strong desire in your heart to be used of God in a supernatural way in a particular supernatural way whether maybe it is to interpret dreams maybe it is to pray and see people healed maybe it's simply to have people realize when you're around that God is real because God is so present with you believe God for that Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name right now, I believe by faith that many hearing my voice are seeking some kind of blessing from you, some kind of gift from you, not to become wealthy or comfortable, but to minister. And God, I begin and pray that you will begin to grant the desires of believers' hearts, Lord to be used of you in supernatural ways. Father, we believe by faith we're in the last days and it's going to take supernatural works where your presence is so obvious for folks to be saved. I pray that you will use all of us in that very special way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, again, it's been a great pleasure uh, to sit in the teacher's chair today. I thank you for coming and being a part. And we look forward to seeing you next week for Lesson 7 in our series on Joseph. God bless you. Real good.